All right, so we're back with <clears throat> muscle contraction again, talking about how muscles function. Our initial discussion has been restricted to muscular anatomy. <clears throat> I believe in the last uh, lecture here, we talked about kind of the muscle cell. It's going to be one of those days I can tell already. <clears throat> and the muscle cell is a long uh, fiber, and within that fiber, we had all of these individual myofibrils. And the myofibril is what's shown here. The myofibril is a grouping of proteins. <clears throat> the most abundant proteins that we find in these myofibrils <clears throat> is a long uh, linear molecule here called myosin also referred to as a thick filament. For obvious reasons, it's much thicker. And really what we've got here is a very unusual molecule that's a bunch of these long linear pieces grouped together in such a way You end up with something that looks like this. And a myophilus, myosin thick filament here. And these long linear pieces with these sticking out. <clears throat> these are called myosin heads, and here they're also called cross bridges. Okay. Myosin head, cross bridge, heads, cross bridges. Okay, the second molecule here that we find is another linear molecule. This one's called actin, also referred to as a thin filament. Okay. <clears throat> and the actin itself, uh, we'll talk about in more detail here in a subsequent slide. But for right now, remember that actin, <clears throat> we can polymerize into a long uh, microfilament. So this individual actin molecule is part of a long polymer here, and there's a second one there. So what we've done is taken these two actin polymers, these microfilaments, and twisted them around each other. There are some other molecules in here as well, but I'll wait until we get to the subsequent slide to break those down, because those are more related to function. But right now, we have these two filaments, thick filaments, thin filaments, and then they're organized in a very specific way within the myofibril. Okay, and that's what we were looking at last time. We take this myofibril <clears throat> here, we said we could break it down into these discrete chunks based on visual anatomy. Okay, we have these lines here, <clears throat> uh, we're going to call these Z lines. Okay, and in the diagram there, they're more wavy, so I'll do that too just to try to match the diagram, okay? And then in between Z lines, we have another line in here that's called the M line, okay? All right, now, <clears throat> there's our myosin, there's our actin. You can see the myosin kind of lined up in here, like this, with the heads, right, at the ends like this. So those are all those myosin heads, also known as cross bridges. <clears throat> so these are individual myosin Right, the thick filament 
And then we have the actin molecules organized around all of this. So these are connected to this Z line. In red here, that's our actin. And go with a different color here, just to try to make this look a little nicer. Based on the way this is organized under the microscope, people name certain parts of it. So we've already got the Z line and the M line, but if we take this location here that just includes the myosin, right, that's called the A band. A band includes all of the myosin molecule itself. The I band includes part that doesn't have the myosin. So here, this is I band. And then this part in here where there's no actin. This is called the H cell. Okay? Remember that first thing biologists tend to do is describe what they're seeing. So this initial description is trying to lay out the microscopic anatomy of the sarcomere. So remember we did that last time. <clears throat> this is the muscle unit. And this muscle unit called the sarcomere contains all of this material between the two Z lines. We have actin and myosin arranged in a very specific way against each other. We have a region of the sarcomere that contains the myosin, that's the A band, a region that lacks actin, that's the I, the H zone, sorry, the H zone. There's a line that's distinguished down the middle called the M line. And then lastly, this portion of the sarcomere plus an adjacent sarcomere that doesn't have the myosin, that's called the I band. And then you might ask yourself, well, of what use is this to anybody to do this kind of description of a sarcomere? Well, <clears throat> when people were first trying to describe what was happening with muscle, they laid out this description in terms of what these zones and bands were doing under contraction. So here at the top, there is my sarcomere between the two Z lines. There's the M line down the middle. That's the H zone. That's the A band. And there's the I band. Okay? This is what the muscle looks like actually under the microscope you can see these very, very detailed <coughs> areas. That has to be Z, Z, M. This is where all those myosin heads are, right? So this area in here, that's this A band. <coughs> and then we have the H zone here, and then there's the I band. Okay, that's when the muscle's relaxed, it's not contracting. Then under contraction, what happens is stuff is going to move, and as it moves, it changes the way the sarcomere looks following these descriptions. So when <coughs> contraction occurs, the A band, the length of the myosin, right, that's this length here, doesn't change. So that told people that the myosin thick filament itself is not contracting. It's not shortening. It's staying the same length. But what's happening is the H zone and the I band 
are reducing in size. And that suggested to people that really what's happening <clears throat> is the myosin and the actin are sliding across each other in such a way that you can shorten the M line and the I band without changing the length of the A band, right? Without changing that length. That meant that these two filaments, the thick and the thin filament, were actually sliding across each other. So what we're going to do now is talk about how that's accomplished on a molecular level. This is called the sliding filament model. <clears throat> Actin and myosin sliding across each other as they kind of move in two different directions. That shortens particular zones, right? That shortens the I band and the H zone without changing the length of the actin or the myosin. Okay? All right, so I, I said before we need to talk a little bit more about the actin uh, filament itself and this is what the actin filament is going to look like on a molecular level. So we still have these individual actin molecules but they're part of two microfilaments that again are twisted around each other. So these are these two microfilaments that contain the actin. Now, associated with the actin is <clears throat> some tropomyosin. should probably do that in a different color. So, <clears throat> we're going to run to tropomyosin. That didn't work too well. We're going to run to tropomyosin down along the actin filaments. Okay? So, actin, and then here is the tropomyosin. There's the tropomyosin. Okay? Attached to the tropomyosin is a molecule called troponin. And this troponin occurs at several locations along this long fiber here. <clears throat> this is the troponin. Okay. And the troponin <clears throat> is covering up particular binding sites on the actin molecule. So if you notice here, there are these little purple circles associated with each actin molecule. You can see them here uncovered. Here they're covered up, and they're covered up by tropomyosin. So the tropomyosin is laying across the actin, and the way it lays normally is to block all of those circles, which are myosin binding sites. So you lay across it, you block those binding sites, that prevents the <clears throat> myosin from interacting with the actin. They have two separate molecules, actin and myosin, and they don't interact with each other as long as the tropomyosin is covering up <clears throat> all of these binding sites. Okay? Now, on the myosin molecule itself, We looked at just one of these pieces here. Remember we called these heads or cross bridges. <clears throat> these heads are able to bind to these actin binding sites if they're exposed. They can't bind in this portion because they're covered up. Okay. Now, in order to get these cross bridges to bind to the actin, what we need to do is expose those myosin binding sites. And to do that, we're going to need calcium. Remember, calcium is kept at low levels in the cytosol. It's kept at low levels in these uh, muscle cells, right, the muscle fibers as well. 
And by keeping it low, you prevent the myosin and the actin from interacting together. If you allow calcium into the cytosol, that's high cytosolic calcium, <clears throat> the calcium binds to the troponin, the troponin changes shape and pulls those tropomyosin fibers off of all of these actin uh, sites. <clears throat> now these sites on the actin are exposed and the myosin cross bridges can interact with those myosin binding sites. Okay, So it's possible for actin and myosin to interact together they interact at these binding sites where these heads or cross bridges bind, but that only happens in the presence of calcium. Calcium is required to get the troponin to change shape to pull the tropomyosin off of the actin. Okay? All right, let's take a look at it in a little more detail, and then we'll do a little more detail. <clears throat> All right, here's my myosin. They're calling these myosin tails and myosin heads. Right. Tails here. <clears throat> okay. There's our interaction. This is what's happening at the level of the sarcomere whenever calcium is present. We get this cross bridge mechanism kicking in. Here, the myosin is not interacting with the actin. Here, there is interaction. In the presence of calcium, the myosin is bound to the actin. And look at the position of these heads. These cross bridges or heads are in this position without calcium. But notice how they're drawing them here in the presence of calcium. They're twisted a little bit. Here versus here, what we're going to do is with binding, as those myosin heads grab onto the actin, we're going to get this little thing called a power stroke. That head is going to twick like this, but since it's attached to the actin when it does that, it pulls the actin in this direction. So here the actin is moving in that direction, here the actin is moving in this direction. And as we pull these two actin molecules closer,